Good evening, Midway families. This is Principal Jackson coming to you with this week's edition of Tuesday Tales. This week, I have the privilege of reading to you Uncle Jed's Barbershop, and it is by uh, Marjorie King Mitchell, and it is illustrated by James uh, Ransom. All right, let's read. Jedediah Johnson was my granddaddy's brother. Everybody has their favorite relative. Well, Uncle Jedediah was mine. He used to come over by our house every Wednesday night with his clippers. He was the only black barber in the county. Daddy said that before Uncle Jed started cutting hair, he and Granddaddy used to have to go 30 miles to get a haircut. After Uncle Jed cut my daddy's hair, he lathered a short brush with soap and spread it over my daddy's face and shaved him, then started over on my granddaddy's. I always asked Uncle Jed to cut my hair, but Mama wouldn't let him. So he would run the clippers on my back, on my neck, and pretend to cut my hair. He even spread lotion on my neck. I would smell wonderful all day. When he was done, he would put pick me up and sit me on his lap and tell me about the barbershop he was going to open one day and about all the fancy equipment that would be in it. The sinks would be so shiny they sparkled, the floors so clean you could see yourself. He was going to have four barber chairs and outside was going to be a big, tall, red and white barber pole. He told me he was saving up for it. He had been saying the same things for years. Nobody believed him. People didn't have dreams like that in those days. We lived in the South. Most people were poor. My daddy owned a few acres of land and so did a few other people. But most people were sharecroppers. That meant they lived in a shack and worked somebody else's land in exchange for a share of the crop. So boys and girls, what that means is that the people were farmers. When I was five years old, I got sick. This particular morning, I didn't come into the kitchen while Mama was fixing breakfast. Mama and Daddy couldn't wake me. Uh, the nightgown and the bedclothes were all wet where I had sweated. Mama wrapped me in a blanket while Daddy went outside and hitched the horse to the wagon. We had traveled about 20 miles in town to the hospital. It was midday when we got there. We had to go to the colored waiting room in those days. They kept blacks and whites separate. There were separate public restrooms, separate water fountains, separate schools. It was called segregation. So in the hospital, we had to go to the colored waiting room. Even though I was unconscious, the doctors wouldn't look at me until they had finished with all the white patients. When the doctors did examine me, they told my daddy that I needed an operation and that it would cost $300. $300 was a lot of money in those days. My daddy didn't have that kind of money and the doctors wouldn't do the operation until they had the money. Boys and girls, what do you think that they're gonna get the money from? Oh, let's see. Mama bundled me back up in the blanket and they took me home. Mama held me in her arms all night. She kept me alive until daddy found Uncle Jed. He found him early the next morning in the next county on his way to cut somebody's hair. Daddy told me about it. Uncle Jed leaned on his bent cane and stared straight ahead. He told daddy that money didn't matter. He couldn't let anything happen to his Sarah Jean. Well, I had the operation. For a long time after that, Uncle Jed came by the house every day to see how I was doing. I know that $300 delayed him from opening the barbershop. Uncle Jed came awfully close to opening his shop a few years after my operation. He had saved enough money to buy the land and build the building, but he still needed money for the equipment. Anyway, Uncle Jed came by the house. We had finished supper when there was a knock at the door. 
It was Mr. Ernest Walters, a friend of Uncle Jed. He had come by to tell Uncle Jed about the bank failing. That That's where Mr. Walters and Uncle Jed had their money. Uncle Jed had over $3,000 in the bank and it was gone. Uncle Jed just stood there a long time before he said anything. Then he told Mr. Walters that even though he was disappointed, he would just have to start all over again. Talk about some hard times. That was the beginning of the Great Depression. Nobody had much money. Man, Uncle Jed was so resilient, he started over and started again. But Uncle Jed kept going around to his customers, cutting their hair, even though they couldn't pay him. His customers shared with him whatever they had, a hot meal, fresh eggs, vegetables from the garden. And when they were able to pay again, they did. And Uncle Jed started saving all over again. Oh, Uncle Jed finally got his barber shop. He opened it up on his 79th birthday. It had everything, just like he said it would. Big comfortable chairs, four cutting stations, you name it. The floors were so clean, they sparkled. On opening day, people came from all over the county. They were all Uncle Jed's customers. He had walked to see them for so many years. That day, they came to see him. I believe he cut hair all night and all the next day and the next day and the next day after that. That man was so glad to have that shop. He didn't need any sleep. Of course, I was there too. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. When I sat in one of those big barber chairs, Uncle Jed patted the back of my neck with lotion like he always did. Then he twirled me around and around in the barber chair. Uncle Jed died not long after that, and I think he died a happy man. You see, he made his dream come true, even when nobody else believed in it. It taught me to dream too. The end. Thank you, boys and girls, for listening to our Tuesday tale today, Uncle Jed's Barbershop. Uh, it teaches us the importance, boys and girls, of following through our dreams. Have a good night.